This is Using the Whole Whale, a podcast that brings you stories of data and technology in the nonprofit world. This is George Weiner, your host and the chief whaler of wholewhale.com. Thank you for joining us. Have you ever been in a situation where you needed to make a personal call, but you were maybe in a meeting or around people that you didn't feel comfortable talking in front of? This was an issue that Crisis Text Line identified as something that was stopping teens from reaching out to hotlines about uh, the crises that they were dealing with. Welcome to episode 18, where we're gonna be talking with Bob Philbin, the chief data scientist at Crisis Text Line, about how they're trying to leverage the call data, well, the text messaging data that's been coming in for Crisis Text Line and what they hope to do with it to improve the lives of millions of teenagers in the United States. Stopped in Kansas at a railroad hotel. Everyone's eyeballing me and it's hot as hell. So I'm here in the Crisis Text Line offices with none other than Bob. Bob, who are you? What do you do here? So my name is Bob Philbin. I am the Chief Data Scientist at Crisis Text Line. Uh, how long have you been with Crisis Text Line? So I started, actually before the system even, in, even launched last August, I started with one other guy, the head of engineering, Chris Johnson, last February. And our goal was to build an app, a web-based app, that counselors could log into and use that to text with teens in crisis. The concept sounds good, but tell me a little bit about some of your early impact and stats behind this. You're a data analyst, you probably can't wait. I'll (laughs) stop interrupting you, you can start telling me right now. So uh, we've already, in our first year, exchanged over three million messages with teens in crisis. Yeah, which is amazing. The the demand uh, actually s- exceeds our supply in some in some ways of number of counselors we have. So our, our big challenge right now is not getting the word out to teens in crisis. They're they're using the service. It's can we get enough counselors to respond to that demand? Interesting. And how are you finding these teens, or how should I say, are they finding you? So one of the most common ways that teens are finding us is actually through Google. So uh, when a teen is feeling depressed or in a moment of uh, even thoughts of, of suicide, one of the things they often do is, is turn to Google to search for information because a lot of times these teens feel isolated, like they don't have someone to talk to, and so they look to gather information in a safe way. And so when they see Crisis Text Line, they realize that they can actually interact with somebody in, a, in an anonymous way and get the information and support they need uh, to move out of crisis. We have very generous support. We actually have um, uh, $40,000 a month in support from Google AdWords to, to get the word out. And we're, we're trying to, you know, trying to use all of it. We're not even quite there yet, but um, it's, a, it's a great way to connect with teens. Great, so I wanna tease out a couple things here. Look, hotlines already existed, right? Like I can call like 1-800, I need help type of hotlines out there, I'm sure if I had Googled them, I would have found that. Why is it that uh, CTL, Crisis Text Line, is actually taking off in this way, do you think? So Crisis Text Line is a, is a critical move for, to a different medium that, that teens are using. There was an article in The Atlantic earlier this year that called texting the number one social media for teens. It's the medium that they use and trust the most to communicate with friends. It also turns out to be, a, a, as a natural extension of that, a great medium for them to connect with crisis counselors, often for the first time. So many of the teens who use our service are connecting to a crisis service for the first time. Some who have used other services before tell us, hey, this is is even better than online chat or phone. And the reasons they give for that are things like, uh, nobody nobody can hear them texting. So oftentimes crises hit while these teens are in school. So maybe they go to a school bathroom. We've actually had teens text us from school bathroom stalls where nobody can overhear them, nobody can see uh, what they're doing. And so it's that privacy is, is a big part of it. One of the other things that they bring up is, um, I talked to a teen who said, I prefer texting to phone because I don't want the, the counselor to hear me crying. And so it, it, it creates a safe space in the teen's mind 
where they're not as vulnerable as they might be on the phone. How does this service work? You mentioned we have more demand than we have supply. Talk me through how a text is handled and what you mean by supply and demand. Yeah, so we have uh, the, the teens in crisis who see some kind of, of marketing around or maybe hear from a friend about the service. And, and we have a short code, which is 741-741. A team will text 741-741 and they'll, they'll get an automated message back saying, hey, uh, thanks for texting us, what brings you here today? Once the teen goes through that initial process, they're connected with a counselor. The counselor is actually not on a phone, they're actually sitting in front of a web-based app, so they're sitting at a computer, just like you would do a G-chat or a Facebook Messenger on your computer, can send a message to the teen's phone and back and forth. And so the conversation will last um, anywhere from uh, 50 minutes, would 50 to 60 minutes, the teen can text back anytime in the future if they need further support. So 50 minutes, the average session. How many yeah. texts in that interaction are you normally seeing for a crisis? It's actually about one text per minute, and that can vary a lot, though. So a teen, I, I, if um, uh, I text this way too, I'll send a bunch of texts very quickly, and then maybe pause and chat with somebody else. Um, uh, send messages to somebody else. but So there are spurts of texting, but on average, it's about one per minute. The interesting thing is texting is asynchronous for teens. Teens don't expect, okay, we're in a conversation, so we're gonna have a steady stream of text going back and forth. Some teens will text for a minute, for 10 minutes, disappear for a few, and then come back. So our counselors are actually sometimes handling two conversations at the same time uh, when because there are breaks in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So we're averaging about 50 texts sent by the teen, but does that also merit 50 responses? Uh, yeah, so it's actually about 50 to 60 messages total per conversation, so okay. about, about uh, 25 to 30 exchanged each way. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, it's pretty equal going from, from teen to counselor responding. Uh, do you know from call centers, for example, if that were an actual call, what is the average length of uh, a hotline call? An average hotline call, if I remember, and um, we can double check this, but around 15 to 20 minutes. So it's uh, it's shorter, but actually the amount of time that our counselors and, and the texters invest is probably about the same because there are those pauses and gaps in the actual communication. This is, uh, this is pretty incredible. It, it seems very simple on the surface, but Talk to me about how you approached building this, because you were there from like day one with Chris Johnson. Yeah, yeah. You're sitting there being like, how the hell do we build a safe, secure, and easy to use text messaging system for crisis? So, and in, in before I hop into that, one note on the last yeah. on the last thread is, I think the great thing about texting is teens don't interact in a in a constant way that's not it's not optimal for teens it's not optimal for a moment of crisis if a teen needs to duck out for five minutes and think through something on their own or they're out in a public place and they need to be interacting with other people texting provides the flexibility to have that asynchronous conversation to what i think is actually optimal for a crisis rather than being on the phone um, for 20 minutes co consistently um, but in terms of so i mean the reasons for texting and are clear and we believe that texting would be the right solution for teens, and the adoption we've seen from teens has proven that. So we came up with a strategy from the very beginning. We realized that as Crisis Text Line, we're a tech and data service at heart. We build a technology for counselors to use, and then we're looking at the data to make sure that our counselors are able to provide the best possible care for these teens. Our primary touch point actually as Crisis Text Line is building this technology for the counselors and they're the ones going out and doing the direct service with the teens. So we built this app by me traveling around the country actually for a few months, interacting with going to um, over, over a dozen different crisis centers around the country, sitting down with counselors for a few days, watching how they're using existing technology for online chat or for phone, and for a few small groups that are doing texting, and then getting the feedback of counselors and building that into the design of our app. So our app is really built for counselors and by counselors. So much of their feedback has been incorporated in, which is really this human-centered design approach, which I, which I love. It's about observing, it's about interviewing and discussing, and um, it's little things like when we first 
design the app, we had a, a welcome page. So we thought, okay, we want to we want to make this feel like a immersive and um, um, engaging experience for our counselors, make them feel loved and and uh, like a part of a team from the very first moment. But when I showed this to counselors, the counselors said, why is there this welcome page? When I log into the system, the first thing I want to do is start talking to a teen in crisis. So get this welcome page out of the way, basically. Right? Stop welcoming me. Get me, Stop get me to, me. Get me to what I need. Exactly. They, they're just so mission driven. They want to get right to helping those teens in crisis. And so we got rid of the welcome page. Counselors are still the limiting factor, and, and so what what we're looking for is more people who are interested in volunteering. We actually recently launched, which is uh, a, a remote volunteering program, mm. and so this is like a Coursera or a Udacity where you can take a course online. We built one for learning how to be a crisis counselor. It's about 50 hours worth of training, so it's an extensive process uh, because it's such critical work yeah. that these people are doing. But um, now you can do it all online and you can do it from anywhere in the country, whereas before you had to be based in a city where a crisis center existed to volunteer, which there, there, there are many, but they tend to be in larger cities like Boston or Seattle. And so suddenly we open the doors for anybody who's in you know, Arkansas or, or Texas or some of these larger places that don't have access to a local crisis center. So we're hoping this opens, and we're seeing actually that this is opening the floodgates for people who want to volunteer as a crisis counselor and have never been able to before. So these volunteers, it seems like we need more of them. How many do you have right now? How many do you need? We have around 250 counselors right now, volunteer counselors, and we're thinking about, okay, we, we've had 65,000 conversations in our first year. How do we move towards a rate of a million conversations a year? To do that, we think we would need around 3,000 counselors. So we're looking to move from 250 towards 3,000. You recently did something which I think is surprising for a, you know, a, a crisis text line or a crisis even uh, service, whereas you opened your data, and this can be like a scary term because you're like, wait a minute, there's a lot of sensitive stuff being exchanged. So what have you exactly done and why did you do it with regards to opening up your data? We feel that our data is valuable in two ways. It's a way for us to improve the service to, to provide a better care to the teens who are using our service. Ult the ultimate goal is always putting teens number one, providing the best possible care to teens in crisis. And so we can look at how our conversations are going and pass recommendations and trainings back to our counselors to say, oh, it looks like perhaps unsurprisingly, open-ended questions are more effective than closed-ended questions. Um, at engaging a teen in crisis. Insights like that are how we improve quality internally. We recognize though that there are practitioners, there are citizens, there are researchers and, and policymakers out there who are trying to help teens in crisis but don't have the data to know how to do that most effectively. With, with limited resources, limited dollars to spend against this, where should they put the money? So for example, a national bullying organization, what state should it concentrate efforts on expanding their services in? Our data answers that question. Uh, for an organization, a local organization considering like LGBTQ, what days of the week should that LGBTQ service be open for teens? Uh, turns out that one of the most stressful days or one of the days teens struggle most with LGBTQ issues is on Sunday. So are these centers open on Sunday? Probably some of them are not. The open data focuses on this aggregate data, so it's no personal information, no message level data, uh, so you can't actually read any conversations, but it shows how these crises vary over time and by state. And so at a high level, organizations who want to impact and improve outcomes for teens in crisis can see where they should start directing their resources. Uh, it's critical that we're opening this data to help other organizations that really haven't had the data around teens in crisis. I don't know of another data set out there that's offering a real-time, large-scale look at how teens are experiencing crisis, both by time, by state, and what issues they're facing. Um, and so 
empowering these organizations to spend their money wisely to actually prevent these crises from happening. Hopefully that happens and hopefully eventually it does put us out of business. So I know you're a data guy, so I have to put you on the spot with this. Uh, you intend for this to be used for up the river thinking by you know major organizations and institutions. Do you feel that you have a large enough database of information to handle, for example, insights coming from non-urban areas? Our data is definitely um, preliminary in, in that sense. We have about a year's worth of data, three million messages. It's, it's a strong data set, but it will only grow in potency over time as, we, as more teams use the service. It will become more powerful. So we don't have that level of precision yet. And I think what's critical is making sure that this is part of a tool set that, that somebody's using to answer questions around how to help a teen in crisis. For example, looking at the top state for, for uh, suicide in, in our data set where teens are thinking about suicide, uh, Montana is the top state. If you look at the CDC's data on where people are high, at highest risk for suicide, it's also Montana. Uh, so there are a lot of alignments between data sets, but it's always important. There are differences when you get further down the list. And so it's important to compare um, what, are, you know, what are the respected, well-known resources in space about how teens are experiencing crisis. And we hope to be a part of that tool set. At what point do you hit that um, tipping point, we'll say, where this becomes wildly useful because we have the volume of data that we need? Yeah, so one of the things that we're really excited about is, and what makes us different from a CDC or some of these other organizations collecting data is, we're moving quickly towards real-time insights on how teens are experiencing crisis. So that's the ultimate goal, and as we grow in size, we're gonna move more towards, like for example, um, last week with, with uh, Robin Williams passing, we saw an immediate spike, 9 p.m. Monday night, traffic doubled and consistently doubled over the next three days compared to our normal trend. So a, a very clear spike and trend coming from a, a public incident. And we want to be able to pass those insights off to the public immediately. Um, we're moving towards growing scale. And I think, again, our greatest limitation is the number of volunteers. If we solve that problem, I think we're going to get to that point where you know, real-time data is, is an incredible resource for, for teens. Uh, uh, for people trying to help teens. We're already there at the state level, but precision will increase. So let's go back to you, Bob. If I were creating a direct service organization, like you know, a hotline and text line to support, um, support teens, like I don't think I would put a data analyst on it first. Well, I would, but because <laughs> I'm an Uber geek. And I'm just curious, what, like, why do we need a data analyst on this team as like, part of the core team? What is your role and how has it uh, shaped the direction of the organization? One of the critical things that data can do for an organization is process information at scale. So when we're talking about millions of messages and, and tens of thousands of teams that we're assisting, we've had 65,000 conversations so far and we're growing to, um, we peaked at something like 450 conversations in a day and so this scale is growing quickly. Um, what are the insights that pop up that an individual looking at the information couldn't see? And so the goal of a data analyst is to turn these insights into processes for the organization. So can we find something like, oh, uh, for example, the number of um, messages that is exchanged in a conversation is highly correlated with, with the quality of that conversation. So more messages, um, higher quality. That's an insight that, that wouldn't come at the individual level, level, it comes from the data. And so being able to pass that insight back to the counselors is, uh, is, is part of my role. Um, and it resonates with counselors when we, when we talk about it. It's like, oh yeah, what teens are really looking for from a conversation is somebody to talk to. And so the longer, the, the more engaged this conversation is, the more messages exchanged, the richer the dialogue and the more that the teen probably derives from the conversation. So my role is really turning information and processes both externally, so uh, towards, um, towards these counselors, but also internally for our staff, thinking about how can we do what we're already doing more efficiently? So we're trying to recruit counselors. Um, we're trying to recruit uh, or get the marketing and the word out to teens at crisis. One, one um, 
thought on this is, is Google AdWords is actually a, a great tool and where I bring some science to bear on what's the right message to send to make our service appealing and, and clearly valuable to a team who's going through thoughts of depression or self-harm. And so we use data to shape the, the messaging. So doing a little A-B testing on what the most effective message is to show. And that increases the number of teens seeing our service, using our service for the same amount of money. We're investing the same amount of resources in Google AdWords, but now doing it more efficiently. What every organization would benefit from from a data analyst is, can we do the same thing that we're already doing, but less less resources spent on that, so less time and less money. And we're constantly finding efficiencies that we can improve. Um, um, how yeah, so on the marketing side, but also on looking at how do we keep our counselors feeling good about their experience. So we talked about okay, we took away the welcome page. Well. One thing that, uh, that we looked into was what's the right color for our app? So our logo is, logo is red. It's this bright, bold red for crisis, crisis text line. And we realized, though, that that would probably not be a good color for the app. It might, red can encourage feelings of anger or frustration or just sort of uh, uh, might be too intense for counselors who are sitting in front of a bright red screen for four hours. So uh, what we did is we looked in the psychological research and it turns out that there's a color slate blue that is the most calming, um, mind easing color out there. And so we actually implemented that and saw a change in how counselors were feeling about their experience in the app, both anecdotally and then through survey research. So talk to me, you opened these data and people can find it online, right? Is that officially launched? It's officially launched and uh, yeah, people can find all the data online and actually interact with the data to see, okay, I want to look at this, uh, I want to look at bullying by day of week and what's the, the hardest day or I want to look at LGBTQ issues by hour of day. So you can actually interact with our data to customize it to find the insights that you're, you want. And that's at crisistextline.org? crisistextline.org slash trends. As you were playing with these data, I'm curious. Was there anything that surprised you as uh, a finding? One of the surprising things for me was around time of day. When are teens experiencing these crises? One, one simple insight was, okay, uh, people thinking about, so teens thinking about self-harm. One spike happens, as people might expect, sort of later on in the evening, 6 to 9 p.m., when teens maybe are after school after their after school activities, they've eaten dinner, they're in their rooms working with homework and, uh, and alone. And so that's a very intense time. The second highest spike though, which was very surprising to me, was 10 a.m. Teens thinking about self-harm when they're in school. And so that's something that I don't think is intuitive, but revealed itself in the data. And there, there are spikes in, in stories like that for every single issue where teens are experiencing these crises in ways that, uh, that I didn't expect, that experts in the space did not expect. Uh, as we begin to, to move and wrap up here, you know, we've talked a lot about high level numbers of our you know, 65,000 conversations and 3 million texts. Are there any that, you know, conversations that kind of like stay with you and you're like, this is why I'm doing this? We have the, the honor of, of being in the office with actually eight of our remote counselors. They, the, these remote counselors work for a parent company of ours that where the, um, the idea for Crisis Text Line came from, do something.org. And so eight staff at do something.org volunteer as crisis counselors. So I've talked to one of those counselors, Naomi, about her experience. And she said she was talking with a, a girl who was looking for a therapist, but she didn't know anybody on the, um, in her town who was a therapist. Uh, she had talked to a few people, but they weren't able to help her and she didn't want to tell her parents. But Naomi was able to do some do some quick Googling, uh, ninja Googling, and locate a local therapist for, for the CNUs. And the just the heartwarming outpouring from this girl to Naomi about basically changing this girl's life and offering that, that consistent help that this girl needed. 
that's amazing. Naomi, uh, you know, love that experience. And, and I love hearing it from Naomi. Like how, how amazing this volunteer experience is for the, for the people who are willing to commit the time to, to do it. It's um, more incredible, I think, than, than any other volunteer opportunity that, that I've done. And um, so it's great to be able to hear that firsthand. As we, as we wrap up here, what do you guys need? Like, what do you, like, what do you need to get to that next level at Crisis Tax Line? So one of the big things, and uh, reiterating, is the number of volunteers. So if you are thinking about wanting to volunteer, this is a great opportunity. The, the people that go through it have life-changing experiences and change lives. And so uh, would love to have more and more people volunteering with us. Uh, we're also thinking about strategies for, for growth. So um, thinking about how can we make this data, for example, this open data project useful to policymakers, researchers, citizens who want to improve outcomes for teens in crisis. So if you fall into any of those groups or, or even crisis, other crisis centers out there, um, we want to hear from you on how we can make this data useful to you. Because uh, up, up top we, on the site, we have uh, uh, this aggregated data that we've released to the public. We're also working with a few researchers at MIT Media Lab and starting up at Stanford and Princeton on some researchers who are going to be doing deeper dives into the data under very careful conditions and deriving insights from those data to help teens in crisis. We want to find more people to partner with um, and so want to hear from you on, on how this data can be useful to your mission. Brilliant. And how do people find you on the Twitters or online? Ah, so I am at Bob Philbin personally and then for Crisis Text Line, at Crisis Text Line on Twitter, and then crisistextline.org. If you want to connect with me in particular, go to crisistextline.org slash trends, and you'll, you'll see all my favorite data, and you'll see a, a box at the bottom to message me about the data. All right, you heard it here. Get in touch with this guy. Uh, they're doing amazing work, Bob. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks, George. Denver in a day, and I can't stop. These are text messages that are really changing the lives of teens across the country, uh, having tremendous impact on their mental health, and I really hope that their open data project does what it sets out to do, which is help inform the policymakers and organizations out there already working in the field to improve the lives of teenagers. I really hope that if you're even slightly interested in this program, uh, and potentially volunteering, that she at least just you know go to the site and check it out. Uh, I can't imagine a better way to spend your time. That's all we have for you today. Uh, as always, wholewhale.com/podcast, and we have some helpful resources uh, that can accompany this cast. As always, thanks for joining us. This has been using the whole whale. For more resources on today's show, please visit wholewhale.com slash podcast and consider following us on Twitter at Whole Whale. And thanks for joining us. I see you're still listening, so might as well keep talking. Uh, this week's music brought to you by Caroline Reese, a uh, really fun sort of take on country music. Um, folk music kind of blended together. I encourage you to check them out on Bandcamp. Also, have it listed on our site, wholewhale.com. Take care. Thank you.